want to begin by introducing our panel and then restating the question. The first speaker all the way at the end, other end of the table uh, to my right is um, Harlan Dalton, professor of law and adjunct professor at the Divinity School here at Yale University. Kelly Brown Douglas, who is the Elizabeth Conley Todd Distinguished Professor of Religion at Gocher College in Maryland. Renita Weems, author, biblical scholar, blogger, <laughs> writer, <laughs> and of course, Tracy West, Associate Professor of Ethics and African American Studies at Drew. My name is Sean Copeland, and I teach theology and African and African diaspora studies at Boston College. Each of our panelists will make a brief statement, and we'll open up for conversation among themselves and with you, all of us together. So just to repeat our question, which is here uh, projected for us, what are effective strategies for eradicating the misogyny heterosexism, and homophobia in black communities in the African diaspora. We'll begin with Professor Dalton. Good morning. You may have seen, have seen a little bit of byplay among the panel a couple of moments ago. We were arguing about who would not go first. Um, I lost. Um, the, the, the last shall be first. Um, I, um, it took me a while, but I, I eventually uh, learned that when dealing with Emily Towns, it's best to do what she says. Um, uh, and <laughs> yeah, hello. <laughs> She's going to win, so you might as well uh, surrender. One of the things she said is to not prepare anything. Um, I'm just, I'm really posting up my co panelists here who've got notes <laughs> on top of their notes. I, I have uh, <laughs> not note number one, I've written um, misogyny, heterosexism, <laughs> homophobia. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, I, th I think I want to start with um, just the kind of uh, dailiness of um, heterosexism and um, how, how um, uh, just how, how normative uh, uh, it is, uh, and not just heterosexism, but but um, uh, the, what, what's the word for uh, um, not so much misogyny, but just dominant the uh, male dominance uh, um, when a baby's born, when a baby's born uh, to a friend of mine, I automatically ask, what is it? What is it? It's a child. It's a child of God. But I'm asking male or female, and I don't even care, right? I'm so programmed to ask that question. And then when I get the answer, what am I going to do with that? Okay, it's a boy. It's a girl. Now what? What am I supposed to say? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but, but, there, but we all are so uh, programmed um, to act as if we care about things we don't care about. Um, and I think in, in, uh, uh, within the black community, particularly around uh, a sexual orientation, uh, we have all the, these ways of interacting that act as if uh, where, we're, where, where we are kind of programmed and we program each other uh, to say things that we may not even believe in our heart, uh, but that have the effect of lancing others uh, in their heart. I, I was invited to speak a few years ago to, uh, at the Body Shop, which is a, um, a program within one of the local high schools. Uh, a friend of mine was a social worker there, and uh, we were talking about heterosexism and, and homophobia, and she particularly wanted a male to come along to speak to the boys. So we separated out. Um, and we had to spend about half an hour with people just saying nonsense that it turns out they don't believe. <laughs> um, and, 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 and what I had to do was just uh, basically say there, sit there uh, and wade through all that. And then we eventually got down to the fact, well, yeah, my brother's gay, and, and I love him more than death. And... Uh, you know, we got to the reality. Uh, and so I think the first strategy is to actually tell the truth that we know, to tell the truth that we know. Um, particularly in, in, the, um, uh, in the black church, we act like we've never seen a gay man in our lives, right? <laughs> and um, uh, often as not, we're looking at one up in front of us in one capacity or another. Um, a dear friend of mine is a, uh, an, an HIV-AIDS doctor in Los Angeles. 
Uh, he told me a story some years ago about uh, going to speak to a pastor of one of the largest churches in that city. Uh, some, I'm not gonna, I don't believe in outing people, so I won't say his name, but someone known uh, to, I'm sure, most people in this room. Um, and one of his parishioners had fallen ill with HIV, and, and, and my friend uh, uh, Wilbert um, Jordan uh, went to the pastor and said, is there something you all can do to support this person, uh, to surround him? Uh, and the pastor said, ah, you know, I've got to attend to my entire flock, blah, 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 uh, and basically um, uh, uh, fronted him off. Um, a few months later, another parishioner fell ill. Uh, Wilbert said, try again, called up the pastor and said, listen, this is your flock. I'd love to, but, but my reputation, et cetera, et cetera. To make a long story short, it wasn't that long before the pastor himself, um, like Nicodemus at night, <laughs> uh, um, called up Dr. Jordan and said, uh, and this time it was the pastor, um, who indeed has passed away, um, but without being able to be su supported and surrounded because indeed um, he was so caught up in, in, um, uh, in the norm. I, I saw some studies recently um, uh, having to do with, um, I'm part of something called the, the Religious Voices Project uh, that Peter Larman is heading up out in, uh, um, uh, uh, actually it's a national project, to look at what it would take to get mainstream um, uh, Protestant churches to um, uh, do better around uh, questions of homophobia and, and heterosexism. And um, there's some interesting studies, and I, and, I, and I wish I could give you the sites to them. Um, I don't, don't have them because I have no notes and I'm not prepared. Uh, but um, the, 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 the essence of, of, of those studies is that they, they ask pastors um, about their own congregations and, and basically how prepared the congregations were to, to do better around gender justice and around uh, sexual justice. Uh, and then they asked uh, um, uh, members of their congregations as well. And, 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 and consistently, the pastors thought they were way, well out ahead of their congregations. They would like to be uh, more forthright. They'd like to be more progressive. They'd like to be more prophetic. But they thought the congregations couldn't handle it. But when you talk to congregations, <laughs> they were, <laughs> right? So, so the, the first strategy is, is to, to tell um, the truth, um, uh, to, to at least to, to, to stand up for what we believe in and to not trim our views um, uh, out of concern, even in a pastoral situation, um, uh, out of concern for what others might feel. I, I have a, I happen to, I'm, I'm a, an Episcopal priest as well as a professor, and I happen to serve a, a, a congregation um, that is... Um, for one thing, the, the, the senior priest is a woman, and, and we've had um, a gay priest and, and, and lesbians and, and in leadership as well. So it's a, it's a fairly progressive congregation. But we have people in our congregation who don't, don't necessarily go along with the program, right? But they, but, but they know they're loved. But, it, but part of my love is not acting like, <laughs> not pandering to them. I mean, part of the problem is we, we too often, uh, those of us in leadership positions, assume that other people uh, just can't deal with, uh, what we believe to be the truth. Uh, and that's actually, uh, to me, um, uh, it's either it's insulting, it's also a failure of, of nerve on our, on our part. The, the final point I want to make is, is that it, uh, um, uh, in terms of strategy, it's just daily, daily practice. Um, in small ways as well as large. It's often the small ways that, that, that um, uh, it's the small insults, the microaggressions that, that, that most uh, uh, rip our hearts. And it's also the small uh, acts of, of um, decency um, that o over time, I think, are, are in many ways uh, most powerful. One of the things that I, that I, I, I mean, this is, uh, I'm not tatting my own horn, but it's just an example. Um, uh, in my tradition, we wear a stole uh, um, uh, 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 on Sunday over our dresses. And um, uh, there's another name for that, I forget it. But, um, and... Um, and uh, the uh, ordinary time, uh, uh, the color for ordinary time is green. So one, my, one of my green stoles, I have a few, but the one I mostly wear uh, is a stole that it just has names of lots of uh, 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 women. Actually, I'm going to make it two points. Uh, uh, on it, um, starting with Eve, um, uh, uh, Mary Magdalene is somewhere uh, and, and on the other side of the stole. And I, you know, I, I, I don't say a word about it. I just wear the stole. That's uh, during ordinary time. That's just... Ordinary life uh, is, is, is the, uh, the implicit uh, message uh, without words. I guess the final point I do want to make is uh, in terms of the church, I also think it's important for, for us to pay attention to, to the scripture and to theology. We often run from it. But, you know, we're, we're in Easter season, right? 
Um, mm-hmm. And uh, the, the four gospel writers, they differ a little bit on their accounts, but they have things in common, which all the boys fell down on the job, right? Uh, I mean, Judas betrayed Jesus, but he's not the only one, right? <laughs> Peter denied him three times. And the others of the, of the 12 all fled. That's what Matthew tells us. And the women had to pick up <laughs> the pieces, right? They took care of the body. Uh, they were the ones to whom Jesus appeared uh, first after the resurrection. They went and told the boys who didn't believe him, right? So, so, in term, so in fact, we need not be afraid of Scripture. Uh, 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 sexual orientation. Jesus did not say a single, single word, right, uh, about homosexuality. And also, the concept didn't exist. That's a whole other piece of the story. But, but even in terms of the, the parts of Scripture that seem disturbing, we need to take them on. Uh, to, we, we allow people to believe that, 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 that Scripture uh, supports uh, uh, various kinds of, of hierarchy and various kinds of um, um, uh, power over, uh, and, and, it, and it's not true. But, but, but so, so we need to arm ourselves with, with, with uh, the good book um, and with a, uh, a sense of theology as well and not run from it. Thank you. I'd like to join my voice in the thanks of to Emily Towns for bringing together and pulling together such a, an important and outstanding conference. When Cheryl Towns and Jilt saw my notes this morning, she said, no, 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 no notes. Uh, d- uh, but, I'm going to ask everyone to please check your telephones uh, and turn them off. If you're a conference staff person, you could put it on vibrate. Uh, That would help us uh, not be so distracted at times. So if you just check your telephones, your cell phones, uh, and make sure they're off. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Professor Douglas. Give a minute for all those dings. In fact, (laughs) yes. Let me check my own. Okay. Thank you all. Good morning again. Yes. <laughs> I was going to tell Kyle School about Cheryl Towns and Jill's who saw my notes and admonished me. Uh, but then she reminded me herself and me as well, that I'm a theologian. And she said, oh, yeah, theology is a context sport. You guys need notes. <laughs> absolutely. I said, absolutely. <laughs> and then I'm also, Harlan, an Episcopal priest, and we need notes. <laughs> so <laughs> he said, yeah, Episcopalians need Jesus, too. <laughs> I never, I never agree with my non-Episcopal people when they say that, but I can definitely. <laughs> we know. But let me try to begin here and keep to the spirit of the conference and, and sort of move from my notes, but without a paper. <laughs> the question, of course, is, for me, uh, to reiterate, what are the effective strategies for eradicating misogyny, heterosexism, and homophobia in black communities in the diaspora. Let me begin by saying that I think any effective strategy, in fact, starts with the question itself. For I am reminded, as we talk about Jesus, I am always reminded of the time in the uh, the Gospels report when Jesus was indeed to eradicate the demon from the man with many demons. And the first thing that Jesus did was name the demons. And so it seems to me that before we can eradicate heterosexism, misogyny, and homophobia, we need to name the demon. We need to name it. And it seems to me that in a very bold and courageous way, that is what uh, Emily Towns has done by this question. Dolores Williams would say that we need to identify the demonarchies which invade our black communities. We must recognize it and name it. Thus, the very question is is a fundamental part to the strategy of eradicating the demonarchy of heterosexism, 
uh, homophobia and misogyny. Second, I think that the second step, at least for me, as I continue in my own work to wrestle with and struggle against the very sins of gender and sexual identity oppression, is to recognize the intersecting realities of all of these isms, phobias, etc. That is this, to recognize that they are all a part of a, a, a social, political narrative of power. That is, they are all a part of white, patriarchal, imperialistic, capitalistic power. Misogyny, heterosexism, homophobia are secreted by that narrative and they feed the agenda of white male hegemony. Inasmuch, you see, as non-white, non-male, non-heterosexual persons can be effectively marginalized, can be set against one another, and as in, in as much as marginalized and oppressed communities marginalize and oppress one another, well then, yes. the white male agenda of oppressive power has been served. We will recall that Audre Lorde once said that we cannot use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. Well, it is the case that as long as we perpetuate misogyny, homophobia, and heterosexism within our communities, not only have we taken up the master's tools, but we are using them to help him build his house. Step three, it seems to me, in terms of a strategy. One of the things that I'm always struck by, and I was reminded again as you talked about this story, uh, with uh, HIV AIDS in this particular church, that it is not until a particular injustice or sin becomes racialized in some way that the black community is then energized to respond. I have been struck by the consistent manner in which that has occurred in the diaspora in the U.S. For instance, surrounding the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic, of course we all know that the black church community in particular was silent at best <laughs> and at worst condemning when it came to the HIV AIDS crisis. Our community was, has been notorious for its lack of response and its, well, non-responsiveness in this manner and the kind of response that it did make, which is in some ways uh, non-responsiveness. Interestingly enough, our black church community has become more energized in the response to HIV AIDS, belatedly, because it has now become more of a racialized disease in that the black community across the diaspora is now disproportionately impacted by this disease, by no small fault of the community that remained silent uh, in the first place. And so again, I'm struck by the fact that it seems to me that it's not until a, an issue seems to, in some ways, be an attack on a front upon blackness, that the black community then becomes energized to respond. Now, first, I find that problematic, but we'll, I have, we'll see what that means. As I thought about that, one of the things that I think we must recognize is that misogyny, heterosexism, and homophobia are indeed not only attacks upon people, but they are attacks upon our very blackness. And, and, and if we perpetuate, participate, or invest with sacred value the agendas of gender and social identity injustice and oppression, 
then that means that we are betraying indeed what it means for us to be black. Now implied in this statement is a reclaiming of what it means for us to be black, a reclaiming of blackness, which has historically meant more than what we happen to look like. Rather, it has meant sharing the Middle Passage experience, and I define that Middle Passage experience as more than simply a journey across the water, but as an experience of being a free people to becoming a people uh, in bondage or oppressed by the layered complexities of bondage. Blackness is a sharing in that experience, and it also implies a struggling against an experience of bondage and oppression. Put another way, blackness has to do with what it means for us to be a community of people committed to struggling for justice and wholeness, freedom for all black bodies. And so it is that blackness has to do with solidarity and commitment. Blackness is an experience of solidarity in oppression and solidarity against oppression. It is the sort of African religious concept of harmony that comes across, comes with us in the Middle Passage. And I can say more about that later. But what this means, in short, is that blackness is not simply a uh, a matter of what we look like. It's not simply a matter of the color of our skin, but blackness involves a morally active commitment to the survival and wholeness of all black persons, regardless. And so it is that in as much as we engage in any agenda, perpetuate it, sustain it, silent about it, in any, any way in which we participate, in any agenda that indeed uh, 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 goes against, does not allow us to sustain black life, or in any way negates the value and the freedom of a black body, then in fact we have betrayed our very blackness. And worse yet, for the church. To do that is to betray the meaning of what it means for God and Jesus to be black. Yes. It is to sin. For our black faith tradition identifies God as black and Jesus as black, not so much because of what they might look like, but because of the way in which they have been engaged in the black struggle for life and freedom. We have been clear at the center of our black faith tradition is the belief that the God that is engaged in history is engaged on our side in the struggle against anything that would encumber our bodies and would prevent us from being whole. It is because of that that we have been able to so clearly say that God is black, that Christ is black. Therefore, to again do anything which would, which would uh, uh, encumber the bodies, which would denigrate the humanity of any black body, is indeed a sin, because it is that which alienates us from the reality and the presence of a black God. Finally, I think that the fourth step, as I'll lay it out here in this strategy of eradicating misogyny, homophobia, and heterosexism within our community is not only to reclaim the meaning of blackness, but it is also to reclaim a prophetic signifying tradition that has always been present within our community, that indeed a tradition that has always called us back to ourselves, called us back to our very blackness. Every community has a, tr a prophetic tradition. 
Of course, we see that in, in, in the early Israelite community. And the part of in the prophetic tradition is a tradition that does not simply critique the injustices out there, no. The power of the prophetic tradition is that it is a tradition which signifies and critiques its very community, calling its community to live back into its sacred self. The black community has always had that and has nurtured that tradition. However, in, 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 in recalling the com last panel conversation from yesterday, that tradition is not tra in the places that we traditionally look for the prophets. Yet it is there. We've got to recover that tradition. I think of one of the traditions that I've been working a lot with lately as I try to move toward the development of a sex body positive uh, theology for the black church. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> one, of, um, one of the prophetic signifying traditions that I've been working with is the blues tradition and those blues singing women. This is a tradition that has named the demonarchy. This is a tradition that has held together and recognized the intersecting and interlocking realities of that demonarchy and how to perpetuate it is to perpetuate white male patriarchal hegemony and all of that. This is a tradition that has signified, not simply upon the wider community, but the thing about the blues tradition is it signifies upon the black community That's right. That's right. in the way it has perpetuated That's right. That's right. this kind of demonarchy. And so it says, I, I leave it here, that one, for me, one of the other fundamental aspects of the strategy in eliminating this uh, homophobia, misogyny, and heterosexism is for us to reclaim our prophetic signifying tradition in listening to those prophetic signifying voices. I'll leave it there. I won't um, repeat um, all of our angst with Emily, about uh, not having manuscripts. I, I feel like I've been set up here. <laughs> I feel like it's a, absolutely, you don't bring us up here and tell us not to have a note. I mean, there's another school you could take me to and not have notes, but this is not the school. But I'm, 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 I'm I, 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 I feel like this is a strategy of somebody <laughs> to set me up. <laughs> Log on. Log on. Um, but move, moving on, so we just, uh, 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 the issue has been noted, duly noted, and we, and we will continue this conversation with Emily for a long time. <laughs> the question is, what are our effective strategies for eradicating the misogyny, heterosexism, and homophobia in black communities in Africa, diaspora, and, and when I, we were assigned our tasks, and so when I was assigned uh, this task, I, I, I immediately read the title and said to myself, uh, you're kidding, right? Uh, this is quite a mouthful. And so my, the cynical side of me had said, said to myself, well, what makes us think that we can do that when even Jesus himself did not do it, uh, could not do it, uh, and yet we are admonished with this particular uh, task? And then I thought uh, about the question. Let me just kind of tell you at least my own history with the question. And when I read the question, I, I, I said to myself, oh, yes, the old what do we do question, the question that students invariably ask after all of that theorizing and all of that uh, academic er erudition is, and so, uh, so what are we supposed to do with this? <laughs> so what are you saying? And so what are we going to do with this? And you're just... You're just kind of sitting there, uh, okay. Uh, there's just something to be said for just thinking about it for a while. Don't you agree that just something to be said about marinating on the issue, on the demonarchy first before we move to the praxis, is it not? Uh, so there's always, there's always this, so, so what do we do and, and how do we do it? And then to even ask religionists, 
to think about uh, what do we do and how do we do it because religion um, it, it does not necessarily in in the most articulate intelligent ways handle these things we just say rebuke it and <laughs> In Jesus' name, and just, you know, plead the blood of Jesus over it. <laughs> but that's another conversation in another community. But like I said, you, I take away my notes, and then I'm just going to ramble. <laughs> we have very effective ways of handling the, 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 the poor, and, and the marginalized have very effective ways of uh, handling is we, we see it in the realm of the spirit, that it is not, as the text tells us, not just flesh and blood. But that's, that's a Sunday sermon here. Here we are on uh, Saturday. Uh, let, me, let me point out a couple of things. And I, and I say that very seriously as a person whose who's, uh, training is in the area of biblical text and um, particularly in, in uh, particular the Hebrew Bible or um, in what, what I will call tomorrow morning in a little church uh, there in D.C., the, obviously the Old Testament. And one of the things I think that um, the Bible, uh, biblical texts have really kind of helped me, particularly at this later point in my life, uh, I'm beginning to appreciate it all the more, is the kind of understanding first and foremost as we raise the question of strategies. I think that the, the, the biblical communities, ancient communities, our, our ancient uh, faith communities, and I think even within, for me, the African-American community it applies as well. There is a sense in which um, bigotry, prejudice, racism, sexism, homophobia, evil is not to be, is not to take us by surprise. I think we're shocked by homophobia, misogyny, and heterosexism. And there's a sense in which in the biblical texts, the biblical stories, that prejudice, if I may use just, I mean, a very soft domesticated term, if you will, and step away from the word evil, there is a sense in which all the way back to the Genesis stories, there's a sense in which whatever else Genesis is talking about, whatever else we might want to say it is talking about, but it's also a sense of which there's always been enmity, rage, separation, tribalism, outsiders and insiders. The nature of humans is to separate themselves from one another, is to form groups, is to form packs, is to become balkanized. It's the nature of human beings. And, and so I, I think for me, I, particularly in my younger years, I think, and many of us, we spent a lot of years being shocked by evil, shocked by racism, shocked by homophobia. And then there comes a day when I think, perhaps for me, when I cease to be shocked. And hopefully it was not just because I was becoming cynical, but more because perhaps that is what these texts were always at least trying to, to remind us rem and ask us to, rem well, get us to remind ourselves that there is something about the nature of humans to form tribes, to see insiders and outsiders. But something else happens when we talk about eradicating uh, misogynism and heterosexism and homophobia. Because it's not just enough to know that we are separate and that we uh, somehow or another uh, are are, there are always the insiders and outsiders, but the way in which that notion of insiders and outsiders become also an economic reality. And so uh, as I was reading uh, something earlier this week by a writer, and I, I think her name is Terpstra, I believe June Terpstra, but one of the things I found very uh, helpful about uh, some comments that she was making, she was saying that one of the ways that you eradicate um, uh, evil or heterosexism and misogyny and homophobia is follow the money. You always follow the money. That even after we have done all these other things, who's funding 
this conference? Who's funding those relationships? That capitalism, by its nature, funds and, and, and funds and undergirds and supports these kinds of ways in which people tribalize themselves and depends upon people being alienated from one another. It funds it, and that's what keeps it going. Um, also, the, the notion of following the money, I, I see that. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking back even, I, I think about even the story of Jesus who goes into the temple and runs out the money changers, those who are funding a certain way of oppressing poor people and um, exploiting uh, people. So the notion of, of following the money, the notion of recognizing that in some ways, while it's not nice, but prejudice is in some way, according to the text, normal. And in some ways or another, we are using text, for me as a biblical scholar, I'm using texts that in, in some ways, on one level, they are the texts that have, that have overlaid a sacred narrative over our kind of, um, over our, our injustices and, and oppressions. But at the same time, it's these texts that give us the language for fighting against oppression. So it's an interesting, I mean, we've, we've noted this many times, and, and a number of people have noted this, that the very texts that we must fight against become the very texts that also give us a language for fighting against. So the language for equality, the language for love, the language for justice, the language of truth, right here in the very same text, where the texts themselves have been some of the worst purveyors, or the people who have used these texts, have been some of the worst purveyors of injustice and oppression and racism and evil. It's the, it's the dual edge of, these, of this particular text that on one level I stand with them as a minister, but on, the, on another level as a woman I know that I have also been oppressed by the very same text that give me the language for talking about oppression. Um, so it's the, the, also the, the very dual nature of, of that. I um, also want to point out that one of the things that I find, again, I, and I, I, I'm fascinated with the way these, the texts give me a language for talking about um, oppression and identifying it. There is a story, and I was just teasing uh, Kelly as we, as we were talking about Episcopalianism. I was at uh, Virginia, the theological seminary in Alexandria, uh, just... High, high church, high church, high church, <laughs> so high church. Um, now, now. Now, now, yes. Um, but one of the things that I was saying in that particular community is that one of, one of the other ways for to talk about eradicating the oppression in our communities is to use the example of Jesus in calling these disciples. And that Jesus would call... Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot. That Jesus would call a tax collector, a Jewish tax collector who's collecting taxes on behalf of the Romans. He is an accommodationalist, <laughs> a assimilationist, a Uncle Tom, a betrayer of his own people, and calls him around the table to sit with a Maccabean a revolutionary, a militant. So Jesus called, so to eradicate will call for radically different people to come to the table who otherwise despise one another. That Jesus would call John Hagee and Osama bin Laden. <laughs> that Jesus would call Phyllis Hickey, uh, what's Hickey? Marilyn Hickey, Marilyn Hickey, and Angela Davis. <laughs> that Jesus would call radically different people who despise, despise one another, 
hate each other's politics and say, if anything is going to be done, I need both of you at the table. I hate the notion of having to sit with John Hagee, Marilyn Hickey, Joyce Myers, and yet, Jesus calls radically different people because we think that we can do it by ourselves. And we cannot do it by ourselves and our own sameness. In fact, perhaps part of eradicating is that it also depends upon us stereotyping the other and isolating ourselves from the other and demonizing the other. We would much rather just change them from afar, but not be in conversation with your oppressor. I, uh, this, this, I was uh, <coughs> sharing with some people the other day that this weekend marks 40th anniversary there at uh, Wellesley where I graduated of uh, the 40th anniversary of, uh, no, not my 40th graduation, and no, I, I didn't say that, no, no. The 40th anniversary of, of Harambe House, and that was the Black Cultural Center, at, uh, and it continues to be there at Wellesley, and some younger students invited me uh, the other day, wanting to know if I was coming, and I was saying no, that I had some other things, but it did take me back to my days at that, at that school, and it was my very first time in that kind of setting, and how in many ways it is to my shame that I graduated from that school and I have not one white friend from that school. I have, there's no one I'm still in contact and still in conversation with. It is like it was a part of my experience, but I left there and I suspect that I am not the only one who left there because I'm sure there are some white women who can say they left there. So before you pity me, that there are probably a number of white women who graduated from that school who can also say, so that we can still, we can be in the same room and still walk away from each other. Still not know each other, still not have conversation. So part of the task of eradication from someone who's an ordained minister as well and as a biblical scholar is asking our question, what makes people do the things that they do? That if, I'm not an economist, I am not a political scientist, and I, and I need the conversations of people from other disciplines to put my finger on some of the hardcore uh, strategies. But as a minister and as a biblical scholar, part of what I can put my finger on is the nature of human nature. And the human nature is to form tribes, to be prejudicial against people. And part of our tasks, obviously, as, 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 as religion scholars, as, as, as religionists, is to talk about how do you even change nature and people's nature? How do you bring out the best in people? How do you uh, uh, speak to the best aspirations of people? Of course, and I am, I am not Calvinist, uh, I, so I do not believe that everybody is so depraved and wicked and that they will never change. There are moments when I feel that way. <laughs> But I hope that what makes us who we are is that we do have this thing uh, finally called uh, hope. Uh, let me, let me uh, close with some comment, uh, with a quote from, and I'm, I'm sure it's something that we have all heard, a quote from uh, Frederick Douglass, um, which amazes me that, that he, this was something that he wrote to an abolitionist in 1849, but it still applies uh, even now. He said, the whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her august claims have been born of earnest struggle. The conflict has been exciting, agitating, all-absorbing, and for the time being put all other tumults to silence. It must do this or it does nothing. If there is not struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation 
are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it is a struggle. Power, as we know, concedes nothing without a demand. It never did. It never will. Find out just what people will submit to, and you have found the exact amount of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue until they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. Finally, the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. Strategies. How much are the oppressed willing to submit to? That is a question, I think, that bears our considered conversation. Thank you. Well, uh, I have two words of preface. Uh, the first one is that I want to recognize that my uh, remarks are very much rooted in my own Christianity and my own Christian context. But if we are indeed talking about the diaspora, we need to talk about much more than Christianity. We've got to talk about Santeria, we've got to talk about voodoo, we've got to talk about condomble, we've got to talk much more widely than about Christianity. So I, I acknowledge that limitation, that uh, inadequacy of, of the way in which my remarks will be couched. And the second um, preface that I'd like to begin with is that I invite you to be in conversation with me in a way that will have some conflict. Uh, you know how you can be going along in a conference and everything is going along just fine. And then there's somebody who gets on your last nerve. <laughs> and um, as Dr. Riggs said, you know, we all have a role to play. Uh, so I know that they're gonna, you know, we, I, had to, I had to talk about some real deal stuff here. And, and I know that we're gonna have some differences. But at this point in the conference, right, we can have, we can have that conversation because you can't talk about this topic and not have a little conflict. So let's go to that place uh, in our conversation and in our discussion, and, and I will attempt to facilitate that a little bit <laughs> as I offer some remarks. Um, and I, I, I just want to say quickly, just a couple points. Uh, one. I am really grateful for the misogyny piece in this uh, discussion about heterosexual, heterosexism and homophobia, because that would be my starting point and would be the piece that I, I, the first piece that I feel like is a strategy. The way in which gender is misogynistically sexualized the way in which sexuality is misogynistically gendered is the starting point for me of the strategy. That's got to be disrupted, uh, that relationship. Um, the, our, our understanding of how those two get linked together, the way in which a, a body, a, a body is uh, understood, it's, it's sexual reproductive, uh, capacity to bleed and to bleed and bleed and bleed as normal for 40 years, a cycle of 40 in cycles and not be ill. That produces a sociopolitical construct of, of woman, which is inherently shameful, embarrassing dirty, inferior. That's, that's a kind of sexualization of gender. 
or, or um, that, that, that ancient African who, uh, who gives us a lot of our language in Christianity. Uh, sixth century uh, African uh, Augustine. Uh, and, and, and there's one piece in City of God where he is talking about, uh, he, he's reflecting on, on 1 Corinthians uh, 11, I believe, and he's talking about uh, the way in which a man is reflect, reflects God and can reflect God by himself. But a woman cannot reflect God by herself, but she can reflect God in, as in, in her sexual coupling with her husband. In her, so in that relationship together, they can be the reflection of God together. And that's how, and it's a, it's a, it's a real, I really like that discussion because it helps us to, to see that kind of misogynistic, sexualizing of gender because it is in that heterosexual sexual coupling with a man is the only way in which she can reflect God. And, and that's a really important base notion for us about how we understand feminine womanness to be a reflection of God, to have an ability to reflect God or not. A difference I have with many of my colleagues, many of my womanist colleagues, and, 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 and beloved, beloved, respected mentor womanist colleagues, is don't take away my Father God. Absolutely don't take away my Father God. And don't ta take away, we got so much mother in the black community, mothers and mothering in the black community. I need that Father God. I need that, 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 that man, Jesus, and to hold on to him, right? So there is a way in which that, that femaleness, that womanness in God as a reflection of God as part of who God is, that's a shameful, inferior piece. And that's a very, very important relationship to homophobia and that, that misogynist piece. Because I think that one of the ways in which hetero heteronormativity, and, and especially gets expressed by, by homophobic heterosexual males. Now, there are homophobic gay males, too, okay? And, and many of them are in the pulpits, in, are in the closet and in the pulpits. But I'm going to talk about heterosexual, I'm talking about heterosexual homophobic males at this point. And heterosexual homophobic males, one of the, one of the ways in which that gets uh, expressed is, is, is in relationship to that, that Leviticus passage, and what is so, what is so intolerable and unimagin un unimaginable it is, not, is not just anal penetration and as, as pleasure, but anal penetration, this idea that you would be treated like a woman, that a man would be treated like a woman. That's what's so intolerable and unimaginable. And, and so disgusting that you would be treated, a man would be treated like a woman. And, 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 is, and, is, and is expressed in everyday uh, 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 prison culture, for example. Right? right? That male prison culture, uh, where a lot of our men, uh, unfortunately, are, are in and, and you know what is a, the, the dominant man he has a stable of his women he makes he makes them your your bee I'm gonna make you my bee and and what that the, the that kind of ultimate shaming act is you become somebody's somebody's woman and and part of the the revulsion um, I, I often hear this um, well being gay is different from being black because I walk in the room and everybody knows I'm black. But if you walk in the room and you're gay, people don't know that. Oh, come on. <laughs> How many times have you heard that homophobic statement about a gay male? He got a little girl in him. I can see a little girl in him. That is the revulse, that's the revul repulsive part, right? So this misogyny 
is so crucially linked the way in which this, this, uh, this gendering, this, this misogynistically sexualized gendering. That's the strategy we got to disrupt that. Uh, and, and um, okay, the other point I want to make uh, quickly is about what does it, the strategy, we need to come up with a strategy for both uh, revering revering and respecting, revering, respecting, and, and, and really seeing a, a sense of, well, this is someone that, that I really care about and, and whose leadership I want to I wanna learn from. And, and at the same time, rejecting, penalizing, renouncing, uh, the treatment of women as sexualized Kleenex. How can we have both a respect and at the same time a rejection of certain kinds of behavior? So I'm going. We're going to need to talk about. We're going to need to talk about. Reverend Hen Henry Lyons. We're going to need to talk about uh, Ralph Abernathy. We're going to need to talk about Martin Luther King. And, and Martin Luther King as someone we revere, respect, who I personally have the kind of, oh, embarrassingly maudlin journey into ministry as a result of, of, of his leadership. But we need to talk about his, I'm not, I, I'm not talking about adultery. Uh, he and Coretta are working that out in heaven. No, 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 I'm talking about sexual misconduct. Clergy sexual misconduct. This idea of treating women as kind of sexualized Kleenex, that this is something that comes with heterosexual male leadership. How do we critique that? We're going to have to talk about Elijah Muhammad. We're going to have to talk about, as we, as we go into the diaspora and we think about the, the leadership in South Africa, about, about Jacob Zuma. Uh, and, and be proud that a Zulu, be proud that a Zulu is, is, is finally going to have a certain, has a certain kind of stature and leadership. That's very important. I, I, I absolutely, we can't deny, we cannot deny that. But how do we at the same time renounce, reject, and understanding? that he put forth, that the, the, the young woman that he, that he uh, raped, he did so in part because she invited it because she wore a skirt. And she wouldn't have worn a skirt. And she wouldn't have crossed her legs if she were not inviting sexual coercion. Some of you are going to be celebrating if he does in fact become, you're going to be celebrating. Some of you are going to be attending. Some of you I know will even be attending his inauguration. I want to challenge that. Um, where's the renouncing? Um, and, and this, we got to talk about um, ways in which, what does it mean? I can, I can forgive you and be in loving relationship with you while, you, while you're in jail for rape. I, I truly can, absolutely, and I, and, I, and I need to be able to, we need to be able to find that place, and, and, and the ways in which uh, I was in Brazil recently, and uh, a, a young uh, black, I was in Bahia, uh, a young black lesbian sister was talking about accompanying an, another lesbian, black lesbian young girl who, when she told her family, that she was a lesbian. Uh, these are these are Afro Brazilians. Um, uh, that her brother, uh, soon afterwards, uh, uh, raped her in response uh, to to that statement. And and then when the lesbian sister went with this 
young woman to an amazing systemic response, which is new in Brazil, to domestic violence. And to the black women administrators, they said, oh, no, that's not domestic violence. And, and so an understanding of, 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 of black femaleness, black female life, of, of, of gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgendered life as, as lesser is, and, and, and as a throwaway, something to be used, uh, is, is an important piece that we have to disrupt. Uh, and we have to talk about more than just black lives. And so as we revere and honor our soldiers who are on military bases all over the world right now, that's part of imperialism, part of our imperialistic uh, 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 drive at this moment, this historical moment, we have to embrace how many, uh, particularly as we're talking about African-American communities, African -Amer military life is very much an important part of our communities and of, of, our, of our lives. So how do we respect our soldiers? But we talk about the use of Iraqi women, Okinawa women. I mean, do those lives matter around those military bases? Is that part of your womanism, of your black feminism, of your black liberationist? philosophy, perspective, and or is, are, those, are those Kleenex to be used uh, in the service? And so this misogynist piece, I think, um, I, I want to, I is really key. And, and key to us understanding this broader notion, um, and then this is the last piece I just want to, I want to end with, of uh, betrayal. I want to resonate with, with what is the nature of betrayal and how do we take that on for ourselves, figure that out, and address what, what is, I know you're going to say betrayal is Desiree Washington, Anita Hill. I mean, betrayal is, is, is an important notion in black communities and, and in especially some of these spectacle moments uh, that are gendered and sexualized. Um, but is betrayal, and how do we talk about the betrayal of black male clergy who testified against hate crimes? Now, now, wait a minute. I'm talking about black males who, in the history of this country, have been the victims of some of the most heinous, ritualized, communally based hate crimes, communal ritual of lynching testified against, against the idea that the killing, maiming, assault of gay and lesbian and transgender people would be considered a hate crime in the name of God. And, and so, and so what, what kind of betrayal does that represent um, in, the ca in, the, in the face of... Um, the Sakia guns and, and other folks. And so every time, every time you talk about poverty as an issue for the black community, are you talking about the gay and lesbian and transgendered youth that are on the streets, many of whom are black? In New York City, overwhelming majority of whom are black. If you're talking about poverty and you're not talking about these kids, and especially from a church context, who are on the streets in part because their mommies and daddies put them out there in the name of Jesus Christ. Because that's what pastor said to do. Um, what, what is betrayal in our communities and how do we talk about betrayal and, and, it's, and it's linked to this kind of misogynized uh, notions of gender and sexuality. Um, so I want to uh, kind of uh, leave it there, except for the last thing I want to say is that for those of, those of us who are here who are lesbian and gay and bisexual and transgendered, what is betrayal of yourself? What is betrayal of yourself? And how do we take that on as a, as a strategy, interrogating those betrayals, reversing those betrayals? Okay.
The panel. <laughs> Probably like, um, like me, you've been inching forward in your seat um, because there's so much here that is challenging, stimulating, uh, befuddling, confusing, agitating, exciting, affirming, disaffirming. Um, so we would like to begin the opportunity for questions. And there are two mics, again, situated on either end of the uh, on opposite ends of the room, and if you just just begin, um, I know that the panel is itching to continue this conversation with you. Okay. <laughs> Tell us your name, please. Uh, my name is uh, William Myers. I'm a New Testament professor at Ashland Theological Seminary. And I want to thank this panel for uh, beginning a wonderful conversation, um, particularly in, uh, as it relates to um, strategy. Um, every year when I teach this course on race, uh, gender, class, sexuality, and the Bible, I notice across the years how the H's keep expanding. I got another one added by Dr. West today, uh, heteronormativity. Um, hermeneutics and homiletics, um, homophobia, homogeneity, uh, heterosexism. Um, and Dr. Douglas talked about naming the demon. And uh, um, Dr. Weems talked about the grouping. And the, the difficulty um, of this subject matter, the multi-axial nature of it. I, I, I would like um, the uh, committee to talk, uh, the panel to talk some more about the difficulty um, in the discourse, some, some, some ideas and thoughts about strategy as it relates to the discourse. Um, because we do have in these black and just using black churches, you know, I don't know if there's been an empirical uh, study of how many of them are conservative over against how many of them are uh, liberal. Uh, Dr. Weems talked about a frustration of mind that when we have this kind of conversation, we are much more talking to ourselves because that group is not in the conversation and maybe not going to show up. I want to, if you could talk some more about the discourse, because for me, sometimes when I'm having a conversation or trying to have a conversation about this, it's not necessarily homophobia, that it may be ignorance of hermeneutics. Um, and the shifting of that, but if if it's all cast as homophobia, um, how do we have a conversation that helps to move us further in in community? Everyone looks and then says, go ahead. And I was looking at them. <laughs> so I'm just going to begin this and then uh, really uh, get builds. Because one, and I appreciate what uh, each of the panelists say, have said, and I appreciate what Renita said, that you got to talk to people who are different than yourselves and that you wouldn't talk to, and that 
uh, and as I look at them and we look at each other, is that we have to understand that it has to be a dialogue because no one person, no one discipline, uh, no one community has the answer, all of the answers to this. And so I, I love these kind of discussions because you can build and deepen the discourse and deepen the analysis. But I tell you, uh, William, you're right on the difficulty of the discourse on so many levels and, and you started at one place and if you start at a certain place then that automatically invites a resistance uh, and you can't get to another place and how do you get people to sort of open up to new possibilities of the way we can be human with one another, new possibilities and new ways of being. One of the things that uh, I often try to do in these, uh, when I know I'm going into a context of resistance, when I know I've been set up, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and there are often times that I've been set up, uh, is that I really start with people in their own experience. That is to say, I try to help people to understand the ways in which they have been othered. Okay, because we have all been in some ways othered and we don't like that. And so I start by helping them look at the ways in which they have been othered and then look at the uh, things, I can, for lack of a better word at the moment, but look at the narratives, the discourses, the idea, whatever, all of those things that have sustained their being othered. Again, oftentimes when we're in the uh, black church tradition, of course you're going to look again at the text, at, at the Bible in some way. And we want to look at the ways, how has that, how have these different aspects of our, these different things in York, that are a part of black culture, and faith is one of those, uh, and a part of the world at large, how have they been implicated in your othering? And if we start there, then we go, ah. Oh. Now, then we make the connections to how we other others and how we use the same tools that have been used to other us to other them. And if you can get people to interrogate those things in a way that is not uh, threatening, in a way that is not uh, accusatory, but in a way in which they are really interrogating their own oppression, when you can start there, then you can get, make get these other connections. So that's one of the, the sort of strategies I've used to open up this discourse of, 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 of oppression. Um, I would also, I, I appreciate the way you, you, you put it, uh, Bill, because um, it reminds me of a book, um, that I've heard or a sermon I heard one of them is that whatever happened whatever happened to sin so and and as as you said your question I said so whatever happened to just ignorance is there such a thing as just people are ignorant when does when is it ignorance and when is it misogyny when is it ignorance and when is it homophobia uh, is homophobia uh, and when we talk about homophobia and misogyny are we talking about the power that when ignorance become powerful, when it becomes a power, a, a, a pattern, a system, a consistent attitude, a way of organizing yourself to other the, you know, I mean, we can go on exponentially to, to talk about that. But I, I, I think what, what happens is that we, we begin with the assumption, even here at a place like Yale and those of us who are here at academics, we like to think that if people knew better, they would do better. Isn't that what Bible study is all about? <laughs> so that's why we open up these conversations in Bible study because we think that if they knew better, if they knew historical criticism, <laughs> if, if they knew what Paul was really saying, if they understood Jesus in his historical context, if they read the book of Leviticus and placed it within its ancient Near Eastern context, they, they would... They would say, yes, now I see, I understand. I sin no more. I sin no more. But we know it ain't necessarily so. That it is not always about text. 
that we use texts. People who do not have these texts are misogynist. People who do not have these stories, who do not even know anything about the book of Leviticus, can be homophobic. So these things are ex extra textual, if you will, in text kind of legitimate some of that. But I, I, I appreciate uh, that, 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 that the question, I don't know if I know how to necessarily answer, but at least I like the way you helped us. When is it just sheer ignorance? And that ignorance, we began with the notion of education, and we want to believe the education. But, I, you know, Benjamin Mays, uh, the former president, Moore, Morehouse once uh, wrote something that I, I, I always quote. He said, people can see the light and choose darkness can know the high road and deliberately choose the low road, you know. That we are, we are who we are and not just because that's just what we believe, but because follow the money. It, we have a vested interest in othering other people. And so when you and I are talking to our, my father, who has no power in and of himself, but his own homophobia and misogyny, I want to say is ignorant. But when he is in conversation with the other men who are equally as ignorant, and then it becomes something else. And then when they decide on the deacon board that they're not going to allow a woman to become a deacon, then it's not just ignorance. It has colluded now and become a powerful system, even at that minor. So I appreciate your helping us kind of just talk about the issue of ignorance. And actually, I want to pick up a little bit on the ignorance. Um, because sometimes ignorance is willful. Um, yes. Uh, when the sister in the end um, uh, began by saying, um, acknowledging that she was speaking from a distinctly Christian perspective and that if we're really talking about the diaspora, we needed to include many other kinds of religious expressions, I sort of felt a little tightening within myself because, you know, I, what do I know about Santeria? But, of course, that's partly willful ignorance. I mean, I'm an intelligent human being, right? I, um, I mean, if I, just, uh, uh, I have it within me to broaden my, uh, uh, my, my capacity, my learning, and my understanding. It would take time. It would take efforts. I'd have to watch a little less basketball, right? Um, but, but, all, but, 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 being, but, but for many of us, um, ignorance is a privilege. Right. Uh, um, and so I think it's important to, to we don't, I don't need to know uh, um, certain things in order to protect myself, right? So I, I actually believe not only in, in, in playing both sides of the street, not only in helping people understand ways in which they've been othered, which I think is a, a terribly important uh, strategy, um, but also helping people understand the ways in which they have done the othering. Um, and there's not a single person in this room who doesn't um, uh, 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 benefit from some kind of privilege, uh, or frankly any room that we're going to walk in, into. And I, um, I find it often useful to, to say something which is true uh, in academic settings, which is that as an African-American male in the classroom, um, I automatically have much more respect, if that's the right word, uh, than women of any color. Um, that's just the way in which um, uh, sexism uh, and racism play out. I at least have the benefit of a penis uh, in terms of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the assumption of a certain kind of, 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 of authority. As long as I can put a sentence together or a paragraph together, I get a certain kind of uh, uh, respect that that um, so uh, so that's and, and I and I, I do I like that mm. <laughs> uh, no <laughs> but 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 do I fight it <laughs> um, uh, I mean uh, yes and no right so so I, I think that it's important for all of us to own um, the ways in which we are part of the the the, the othering of others as well as um, those situations in which we are the other. See the line keeps getting longer, but but I, I just real quick I wanted to say how how can we have more integrated conversations? I guess is partly what I want to say is not just like the week you talk about sexuality or when you you start to talk about homophobia. Um, what what I'm challenging us to do is is when we are honoring when we are commemorating um, 40 years since the assassination of Martin Luther King. <clears throat> And we are talking about what it means to honor and claim this legacy and learn from it. What does it mean to talk about this kind of heterosexualized version of, of misogyny so that what we expect in our leaders, what we think of as a black leader, is a heterosexual, charismatic male with some honeys on the side? And that, that 
gives us a heterosexist understanding of leadership. And we have that conversation in conjunction with claiming, claiming and honoring. Uh, as um, Dr. West noted, the line is getting long. So what we might try, I think, is to take perhaps two questions to see if they can correlate and give the panel, we have, because we have about 17 minutes left uh, before our break. So uh, why don't we start uh, with, uh, yes, uh, Mrs. Highbow, and then we'll go to this side, and we'll just try to hear a couple, maybe three questions, and then try to get the panel to respond a bit. Uh, Dolores Highbow, this has been a mountaintop experience for me. And I embrace each of you and all of you for allowing this simple layperson to be here today. The message has to go from the mountaintop to those of us in the pew. And I know that that's a challenge because the pew people sometimes feel, you know, I don't know, they, they, they are static. You've got to move us. You, in order to save us, you've got to move us. And so my plea to you is to find a way find a way to get that message to those of us in the pew. And I spoke to Sean about confessions. Demons don't uh, confess, do they? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Be sure to give us your name, please. Okay, my name is Lorena Mast. Um, the only thing I... Um, one of the first things I was thinking as um, with all this information coming forward this morning uh, is basically about the sexuality part of it, uh, more so than eradicating, yes, but I think that in my opinion, this is not just or my, primarily about a prejudice. This is about ignorance. This is about um, a generational and historical cycle of improper love, cyclical and the improper showing of love and the improper showing of intimacy. I think it's also about the under, underdeveloped intimacy with people uh, being able to express themselves uh, and, and interact sexually as well as intimately with each other in a sexual fashion and with God. A lot of people can't even intimately pray or intimately go into the threshing room uh, with God. And um, I think that is connected to my focus on the whole sexual issue uh, and sexuality and, and hating somebody else because they're doing this sexually. And I think that a person's soul and a person's purpose and, and the purposes of God cannot be dictated by the operations and the interactions of their genitalia. I don't think we need to see that first. I think love covers a multitude of things. And if we enable and teach from the pulpit, as she said, on out, in the church or in your places of worship first, how to love somebody first, then follow the spirit of God or your spirit and your purpose to further along and interact with that person, then we can have a healthier uh, mental health, a healthier sexuality. I think it's about just the ignorance of those two things, of sexuality, mental health, and intimacy, and the cyclical lack of, of proper love and underdeveloped intimacy within a person, that we shouldn't just focus on the genitalia and what their genitalia is doing uh, when we see a person. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more before we, uh, we, we let the panel open up. Well, I know. Is there, if there's a real question, there is a question. Hello? Hello, okay, all right. Here we go. go ahead, I'm sorry. Roger Sneed, Furman University. Um, one thing that I've noticed in a lot of these kinds of panels when there's talk about homophobia, particularly homophobia, is a continued linking of black, gay, and lesbian lives with death, with death and homophobia. And I think another effective strategy might be shifting the dialogue, shifting the focus away. I mean, what are, who are these black, gays, and lesbians we're talking about? Who are these subjects of homophobia? What do they have to say? Where's the, well, as uh, Marlon Riggs said, let the queen speak. And let the king speak too. Wh you know, where are we in this discussion? Why is it we're always in the background, receding ever into the background as subjects of, as, as victims, and never 
uh, discrete rational subjects who are saying, yes, this is who I am, this is what I'm about, this is, this is who I am in the light of God or if not in the light of God. So that's uh, my piece. <laughs> Thank you. This is, uh, this is really about listening. I mean, I think the panel started out by talking about listening and about attentive to, to whoever we're in front of, we're connected with. So, so this, is, this is very good, I think. Um, is there, sure, go right ahead, absolutely. One thing, I don't know if they can see it. Is, just pull it up close, pull it up close. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, just one thing, yes, thanks. To just a... Quick response, and it uh, also uh, further builds on what uh, G Tracy said. This thing, with the uh, young woman was speaking about this matter of sexuality and genitalia and all of that. And I just want to say real quick, one of the essential aspects of these narratives of hegemonic power, uh, sec the sexuality and power thing go together. And one of the things about these narratives of power is, first of all, they, they essentialize sexuality. Sexuality is not simply about uh, sexual intimacy, genitalia, et cetera. Sexuality has to do with the whole of who we are as embodied beings and how we relate to ourselves, one another, and to our God. Uh, and so sexuality isn't simply about genitalia, but narratives of power essentialize sexuality. Then with that essentialized narrative of sexuality, if you can follow me, they then sexualize the people that, that, that narratives of power marginalize. And so you are right <laughs> that uh, Audre Lorde talked about it in terms of the power of the erotic, that we have to reclaim our sexuality. And that we have to fully understand, and this is what, uh, in some respects, again, Tracy is talking about, these, the relationships between the way we centralize and sexualize, and, and it's a genderized sexualization. You are so right uh, uh, about that. The way we do that to the people that we oppress and marginalize, and that is across the board. So I just wanted to uh, resonate with that. And then in terms of the gentleman's last comment, uh, all I can say is that what we, a part of our task uh, as people, as black people and as all kind of people is to create the spaces, the safe spaces where people can be who they are and claim their voices for who they are. And so, you know, and we have to do that for, uh, uh, in our communities for uh, queer, gay, lesbian, transgendered persons and others. We've got to create the space so they don't have to recede into the background. Uh, so for people to claim their own voices. Okay, uh, you saw Professor Towns here. and We're gonna have to really keep to our time. So. Uh, if you have a question, please state it uh, clearly and succinctly. Okay, I have two quick questions. Um, the first is we have a space in church and in theological education. I've heard a lot about doing something in the pews. What about in the classroom? Mm -hmm. um, Dr. West had mentioned that. So what about theological education? How do we talk and teach about sexuality when it's a second class subject? Okay. And how does that feel as the student who's then the second class student in your in there, and how do you talk about it in a way that uses clear truth-telling language? We all winced and laughed when Professor Dalton said penis. Mm -hmm. How do we talk about mm -hmm. this if we can't say the words? Mm -hmm. Okay, is there another quick question that connects with this? Another quick question that yes. connects with this. Okay, go. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out how we prepare a new generation of ministers to do ministry to and with um, people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender when the paradigms that we've been working with have been love the sinner, hate the sin, or where we create a culture of invisibility. And so I'm wondering for you if you, you know, are in the business of preparing a new generation of, you know, leaders in ministry, then how do we go about creating those new paradigms of, of doing ministry to and with those particular people. Okay, let's can get something on this. Tracy. Sorry, just uh, very quickly, I have got to give uh, 
shout out example uh, that has to do with the parish of uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Dennis Wiley sitting right in front of me and his uh, the way in which his ministry in Washington DC has been emblematic of uh, profoundly liberatory uh, black liberatory practice and his performance of, of same gender marriage and in his, in his congregation and the way that the, the struggle anyway he can tell his own story but I have to point out that certain practices it's not about what you're just what you're preaching in the pulpit and what you're teaching is what what are your practices and and shifting those practices and and talking um, and teaching about changing uh, yes changing the nature of of marriage and understanding of marriage uh, stop bowing down at the idol of heterosexual marriage and worshiping it. And so as we are teaching and teaching in a seminary context about ritual, um, what does it mean to have an understanding of marriage? This is just one example because it's such a, uh, a particular topic that um, same, gen same gender loving marriage and co covenant what, how do we shift marriage to a relation to an understanding that has to do with how we treat one another so that all of, of the heterosexual example of violence and abuse um, does not get reproduced? So we, do, we, we absolutely need to shift and change and transform and transcend. And so a more 202 conversation um, among uh, same gender loving couples um, among people who are LGBT and heterosexuals um, can be this this kind of a conversation and it can have to do with ritual um, it can have to do with ethics it can it can take place in a number of different um, kinds of classrooms and settings uh, that are in church and in academy um, so I just wanted to put that as an example one concrete example um, I, I would have a, a an also, in a, I, I thank you for mentioning um, Dennis, who I was just with just the day before yesterday in another setting. Um, and let me uh, try to be succinct, but I'm, I'm just kind of mental fraud leaping here. It's, and sometimes I hear things about what the church is, particularly the black church in this instance, is or is not. And, I, and I, there's a side of me that says, when if there was something that Tracy said earlier about putting putting uh, people out of the church because of their sexuality, and I, I guess in some ways I have been very fortunate because I sometimes I find myself recalling and saying that's not the church that I know, and and I know that I'm I'm one of the lucky ones. I mean, I, but I I know how the rhetoric goes, and I know how we're supposed to say yeah, you know, the church is like that, and I'm and there are a few of us who say not all churches. We, we can have yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that wasn't a conflict. That was an observation of my point. And that not, all, well, and I'm sure that all of us would concede not all we essentialize the church as well. My point is that one of the challenges of teaching uh, seminarians or, or activists, period, is to be able to place them in places where there are people who are trying to do the very work that we talk about, uh, because there is such a failure of imagination among. Of uh, among us, even as speakers, as preachers, you know, the students who say, "Oh, you know, this is really great stuff," but I don't know how to preach this. And some of that is, it's a failure of imagination. Never having been around people who are imaginative preachers, and I often told seminarians, you know, if you can, if you can talk people out of giving money to build a church driveway, and uh, and they did not want to do that, surely you can talk them into having a gay assistant pastor. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's the same rhetoric. It's rhetoric. That's all. If you commit, if you want that roof on that church, you're going to find a way to make that text get that roof up there on it. And if you if if you if you are committed to that, you do that. When we are committed to something, we have all isogeted text to make it do what we wanted to do. So why don't you isogeted it to do the right things as well? The radical, the radical work. And, and there are those, there are churches, there are, they are not perfect places, but there are places like Dennis's church and other churches where there are pastors or ministers and activists who are trying to do that, that work, the work of, 
of, of, of looking at texts with new eyes, uh, the work of uh, including more people around the table, the work of transforming, and the task for a lot of students, I think, and, and for the, get back to one of the students who asked the question, is, is for those of us who are, are teachers and those of you who are students, trying to find those places where you can go to see it is being done. It is because we, we, we have mastered deconstruction. We are piss poor at constructing. We are master demystifying and talking about what is wrong. But we are poor at talking about how it's being done to make it right and who's doing it and who are the people who are out there in the trenches. And that, I think, is the challenge for all of us to, to broaden our knowledge of what's going on throughout in, within the church and outside of the church in terms of those activists who's, who have their sleeves rolled up and doing the grunt, nasty work of struggle and transformation. They are not in the academy. We really have uh, one more minute only. And so if you haven't asked a question, either uh, today or yesterday, uh, could I ask, could we, could we cede the microphone to someone who hasn't had a chance? So very quickly, please, very quickly. Yeah, I haven't asked a question, but uh, I think part of my question has been answered. And I thank you, Dr. Uh, Weems for saying what you did because I had an experience at Yale Divinity School where I was in a class that was very much open to having this kind of conversation. But what generally happens is you don't have all parties to the table and I think that's what Dr. Myers was asking. And one of the, the women asked, how do you get it to the laity? I serve as a pastor. And so I think this kind of dialogue, but being more inclusive to have all people at the table in a university, in the academy, then prepares people like me. But I also want to just say, um, Dr. Weems, as you started out and you expressed your experience in the black church, I think just how the interaction happened, that's what happened to me in class, in the classroom. So my question is this, how do we, in fact, do what you suggest without parties being threatened and intimidated in a way that the conversation never happens. And I always felt that the academy was the place to do that because you have learning, creativity, and the minds, and the mindset, and the diversity in order to make that happen. So I pose that question to you. We, all, we always ask, and how, do, how do you, you know, how do we do this without? I mean, there is, you, you, I think you gotta get the word without out. There is no such thing as doing this kind of work without making people feel threatened. That, that, I mean, that's the way you couch the question. But, you know, I know people feel threatened, yeah. how do you get it beyond? Because when people feel threatened, what they do is put up the block. Yeah. Well, you know, let, me, let, me, let me use, an, let me use a, 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 a heteronormative example. <laughs> that's my word. Okay. <laughs> I'm heteronormative. I, I'm married to a pastor, and one of the things he loves to tease me, he says, Renita, you are, a, a, you know, you go around and speak. You've got 34 minutes to be brilliant and wonderful. He says, I have, when I mess up on, because when I critique him about, oh, that was such a harvest, I mean, why did you do this and why did you do that? And, what, and then he'll say to me, but you know what? I always got next Sunday. <laughs> you got to be wonderful in one sermon. <laughs> I got next, meaning change, I will be with these people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. People will let you whip them, yeah. spank them, challenge them if they know you love them and you're coming back. It is when you want to be wonderful uh -huh. and, and you have one, you have no other, when you have a relationship with people, you give them the chance to be pissed at you, angry with you, threatened by you, but we're coming back. Yes. We're rolling up our sleeve and I'll be right back here next Sunday and we're going to fight this out. And I think that's how, that's at least minor, very small pastoral way, the way change happens in relationships, not in being wonderful. We're going to have to uh, bring this to a close, and we've had a wonderful hour and a half. <laughs>